Woodward, where muscle car legends were born five decades ago. And every year, those who either remember or miss the war for street supremacy that was waged on this Detroit, Michigan Avenue, return to the Woodward Dream Cruise to relive the powerful past. The Chevy Corvettes that cruise down Woodward are a big part of this high compression late summer show. Especially those that have received a muscular makeover in this Decatur, Illinois building. Lingenfelder Performance Engineering is a company that's 40 years old. It was established by a distant relative of mine, uh, John Lingenfelder. John was a real famous race car driver, actually uh, uh, had 13 NHRA Grand National titles, was an incredible engineer, and built uh, horsepower and Corvettes like nobody had ever seen before. Uh, actually was the driver of the famous sledgehammer car uh, that uh, was out uh, for Callaway and um, drove it to its record speed. Um, John uh, wasn't afraid of anything. Uh, did an incredible job building the company, building our brand, and uh, unfortunately passed away after racing from injuries uh, uh, in a racing accident in 2002. And, John's brother Charlie convinced me to come in and take the reins of Lingenfelder Performance Engineering and I've been running it since then. We specialize in building um, Corvettes for the most part. Uh, that's been our heritage. The Corvette is, uh, from my perspective, the essence of sports cars from start to finish. And uh, it's been a car that uh, General Motors built, did a great job with, built horsepower, but left some room for us to really build a whole lot more horsepower. Uh, their light uh, handling over the years has gotten better and better. Uh, we've had a great time drag racing Corvettes over the years, and uh, we're looking forward to the new C7 so we can make some more horsepower and drag race that car. My passion for Corvettes is probably deeper than a lot of people uh, can really understand. In fact, I think some of my friends think I need psychiatric help. I'm so focused. But, you know, I'm, when I'm around Corvette guys, car guys, everybody understands what it's like. and and uh, understands the collection and understands why I have 250 cars and, and why I enjoy the hobby like I do. And started collecting cars about 25 years ago. Uh, I actually started my first collector car was an XKE Jaguar. Sometime in the uh, middle 2000s, uh, we realized how much people really like to look at the cars and decided that it would be an opportunity to share cars with other car clubs and things of that nature and started to do events at the car collection here with regard to uh, uh, bringing people in to look at them. The Duntoff Mule car is one of the most significant cars in the car collection here. It, it is truly the first V8 Corvette. It has lots and lots of history to it. The engine was built by Smokey Anik. It's got incredible history. It's been through all kinds of uh, uh, different uh, racing of venues and things of that nature and it's a car that people love to come to the Lingenfelder collection to see. Well this is a really significant car. It's a 1954 Corvette. It's called EX87 is kind of the, na the name that it has and that's because General Motors it was tagged that experimental for EX87 was the car number. So this is a car that's known as the Duntoff Mule. Zora Duntoff wrote this letter that went to all the top brass at GM that said Corvette has to have a racing heritage if it's going to survive. So we need to create that racing heritage. Well, this is the car that started that. This is the car they gave him to prove that. So uh, Zora Duntoff, the chief engineer of the car at the time, uh, came up with a plan to, to take one of the pre-production V8 engines, took this car, and sent it to a Florida to Smokey Unix shop. And Smokey was a famous guy for racing NASCAR, and, racing all kinds of other things and he was known for thinking outside of the box. He took that, took it all apart. The factory engine was intended to be 265 cubic inches. They took that engine and he upsized it to 307 cubic inches. Uh, Zora Duntoff worked with the engineers back here in Detroit and they came up with a camshaft profile that uh, ultimately became known as the Duntoff 3030. So Smokey used that camshaft, upsized the cubic inch, did some aero modifications to the car that you see with the headlights covered, took the windshield off, put a small windshield, put a tail to create aerodynamic and it, where the driver sat, covered the passenger seat, and some other things. They did some suspension modifications, things like that. They took the car to the Desert Proving Grounds that GM owned out in, uh, in Mesa, 
went uh, 162 miles an hour with it in 1954. So that was phenomenal to have a car that could run that fast in that period of time. So got a lot of attention. It did exactly what they set out to do. It was late 54 in the model run and the 55 Corvettes were getting ready to come out. So GM wanted to uh, take the opportunity to set a record at Daytona. So they shipped the Duntoff Mule back to Smokey Shop in Florida, shipped a new 55 Corvette to Smokey Shop, where they took the engine out of the Duntoff Mule, put it in the 55 Corvette, and went to Daytona and set a record with it. The Duntoff Mule at that point was just a development car, and that went back to GM and uh, went off to do some other things, lived its life inside GM. When they finished the 55 with the V8 in it, the second, the new production car, it went back to Smokey's shop where they took the engine out of it. And Smokey, at somebody at his shop, took the original bill book for that, put it on top of the engine, covered it with a sheet of plastic, and stuck it under a workbench where it sat for 47 years. This gentleman that found out that this engine existed knew where the car was, so he went to Florida at the auction, bought the engine, then went and bought the car, and then totally restored it. Ken obviously loved the car, wanted to own it, but wasn't uh, in, you know, going to spend millions to own it. And it got to a point, and the gentleman pulled the reserve off of it, expecting it to go much higher, and it didn't. And Ken was able to buy it for a very reasonable rate. One of the amazing things about the car is that it runs and drives, and we drive it. We own a, a repair and service shop that uh, specializes in servicing and re restoring Corvettes. The nice thing about our business is that, you know, we can take the time to really make these cars as good as we're capable of doing it. And hopefully we can at least match factory standards in every case and hopefully exceed it most of the time. So we can take the time to level the surfaces, make the gaps uniform, make the panels flush, blueprint the engine blueprint the, the spindles and make this car ride and handle and dial in all the clearances you know to, to where only the racers would have done it to that degree but we can take the time to make these cars that good so they're really a wonderful car to drive when they're thoroughly restored that way you know the windows will roll up and down the doors will close like jewelry and that's what our goal is is to make these cars really um, at least as good as new when we're done you know among the cars that we've done for Ken uh, probably my favorite is the car right behind us here, this 54 Corvette, which is a, a styling exercise. And there's a number of things that are not as stock as uh, the original ones. They did it in this uh, silver color with a two-tone alligator interior. It has a number of special features on it, like the most obvious is probably the headlight treat treatment. Well, the shark fin that you see in this 54 was an idea that they had a design staff and they built three cars this way, and uh, one of them was this car here. You know, they made three and a half thousand fifty fours, but they only made one silver one equipped like this. So this car goes to a number of you know concours and uh, special uh, you know display events, and it's such an elegant car that it always gets a lot of attention. This is kind of an interesting uh, situation that we have here. Uh, this kind of, well, it, it's easy to illustrate how these Corvettes were actually manufactured. If you look closely here, you'll see that there's a metal frame that goes around the windshield, and that frame actually goes down inside the hinge pillars, across the rocker, and up inside the lock pillar. And to these parts, the, they would start by attaching, and they would rivet a bonding strip. So a bonding strip is nothing but a piece of fiberglass, a rough piece of fiberglass, that was glued to the bird cage. And these were roughed up on the outside and they could 
at attach the outer skin or the outer uh, fiberglass panels to the bonding strips. That's basically how they built the cars. This is the, the lower fender. We've removed the upper surround panel because it had some contamination and was preventing us from keeping paint, it, it, preventing the paint from adhering. So we've ground that away. The new panel will go on there. We'll clamp that in place. We'll put adhesive there and, and install the new panel around there. You'll recall these cars had the uh, these supports in here had bearings so that the headlights would rotate in here. You can see there's there's some metal in there to give it some place to bolt to. And this, the header likewise, we were talking, like so you see this panel here is, a, is basically a bonding strip and it's riveted to a metal support header. So they rivet this on and onto this is where we glue this, what we call the surround panel, which is basically what will close all this up other than the hood. Okay, what we're looking at here is a 67 with the front end surround all assembled on it. It's, it's getting ready for, for final paint. You can see we've had to do some repairs along that edge. After we install the surround panel and glue that all in place, we will put the hood on the car and try to fit it. If you look closely at this, this is a sheet wax product and it comes in different widths. It's like this is an eighth of an inch. We'll cut this product and put it inside the gaps and, and, and shape that so that when we run our body filler across these panels, it'll ensure that we maintain a gap that's exactly the width of this, this product. Finally, we've achieved the moment that we've all been waiting for. The car's now been painted, clear coated, and uh, ready for final polish and reassembly. So you see how we have a beautiful car, a um, lot of attention to detail. All the, the uh, secondary areas are finished in the same manner that the outside of the car was, beautiful gloss. This isn't typical of factory production. This is what we do for a show car finish. Uh, the factory never had the time to spend a lot of time detailing those areas, but as you can see, uh, a lot of customers, they, they prefer to have a very, uh, let's say, over-restored car, and that's what we've accomplished here. Bob McDormand began the dealership that bears his name in suburban Columbus, Ohio, in 1965, just after Corvette entered its second decade, and Corvette production was in the middle of the mid-years. But eight years before he became a dealer, he became aware of Corvettes right from the start. In 1953, a Chevrolet dealer that was in the town of London, Ohio, where I lived, came around the corner in a 53 Corvette. And I, I realized who was driving it. And I was mowing my mother's lawn. I thought, damn. Yeah, well, I went down to Sherry the next day and I spent two hours looking at the car. Just couldn't believe they designed a car that sharp. So from then on, I really loved them. I never could own one. When they came out with a 63 split one, I wanted that so bad I could taste it, you know. So I really never got to own one until I became a dealer. At that point, however, a case could easily be made that Bob McDormand made up for lost time. The present collection, spread out over more than half a dozen buildings at the back of the dealership's lot, contains, at last count, well over a hundred vintage and newer Corvettes, along with 80 or 90 classic Chevrolets of all kinds, more than 200 cars. Okay, here's a dream scenario. You're one of the largest, best-known Corvette dealers anywhere in the country, 
And through the years, you have the ability to say to your customers, here's a Corvette for you, and here's a Corvette for me. And you'd wind up with one of the most amazing collections to be found anywhere. In a very real sense, that's what Bob McDorman has done. But more to the point, this is actually the third incarnation of Bob's collection. Others have come and gone for various reasons. And in reality, he didn't normally take his collectibles from his own showroom. He'd find them wherever he could. Kept working uh, to get like serial number ones and stuff like that. I didn't get any off of General Motors. I bought them off of dealers or individuals. But wherever they came from, they're impressive. Rows and rows of pristine Corvettes, at least one from every year of production. And that focus on low serial numbers, it's a bit overwhelming. Everywhere you look, there are cars that are among the first to roll off the assembly line during their year of production. Uh, I'm more interested in about as much as I am anything. Low mileage is the next thing. Uh, or very high option cars that they build. Very few of them. I'm interested in that or a celebrity car like Jay Leno or something like that. I'm trying to get one off Jay Leno right now. Well, there's certainly precedent for that. Former celebrity-owned Corvettes are spread throughout this collection and underscore the appeal of Corvette to all levels of society, including celebrities. But for as long as he can remember, Bob McDorman has been a GM, Chevy, and particularly Corvette guy. The Corvette's a... Uh... Every model change and body style change they like, I like, you know. I have not really seen a bad one. And en route to having one of the premier Corvette collections in the country, he has built perhaps the nation's largest collection of original GM and Chevrolet neon signs, roughly 500 of them, all in working condition. This sign, one of only two known to exist, has an estimated value of more than $100,000. It stands near a built-from-the-ground-up classic service station that is among Bob McDorman's favorite possessions. But for Corvette enthusiasts, all these extras simply provide a nice setting for where the real interest lies in more than nine dozen Corvettes that would make even the slightest fan envious. Welcome back to Corvette Nation. You know, recently the Corvette Nation team traveled to Funfest, where every year the Corvette is definitely king. Where the new C7 Stingray shares the spotlight at Mid-America Motorworks annual September celebration at the Effingham, Illinois headquarters with thousands of Corvettes, 50,000 owners and visitors, all here to soak up the magic and mystique of America's favorite sports car. The weather was beyond perfect this year, as FunFest continued its 25-year tradition of gathering the coolest Corvettes and brightest stars from the Corvette community all together for one glorious event. I'm here today at Kerbeck Chevrolet, one of my favorite spots to stop at the Jersey Shore with Charlie Kerbeck. Welcome and thank you, Lance. Oh, I'm really happy to be here. Just look at the beautiful setup you guys have here. And I have the tough job of picking my favorite car, which happens to be right next to us, EX122. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, Lance, it's the GM Experimental Prototype. And this vehicle made its debut at the Waldorf Astoria in New York prior to there ever being a Corvette production line. And there are many unique things about this vehicle that exist only on this experimental car. These scoops didn't 
appear on the 1953 production Corvette. This molding is unique to this vehicle. Actually, the production vehicles, this wing was up and the molding ran the whole length of the car. When this vehicle was first manufactured, they really felt that it would be a road rally car. And the grill that covers the headlight for stones that may break a headlight, they hinged into the front fender that's unique only to this automobile so that this can open to clean the mud off of the headlights. Neat thing is, look at this script. I know that's a little bit different than the 53. Absolutely, Lance. Unique only to this vehicle, EX122, and it's in gold as it was when they first hand-built this automobile. This interior, these seats are actually leather and they were handmade back for the experimental car as most of this car was handmade. In addition to that, there are push buttons on the door. There were no door handles originally. Uh, you had to reach inside the car to open them. Charlie, one of my favorite things about this particular vehicle is the VIN plate. Anything that has EX on it is cool in my book, and I'll tell you what, it's so rare to see, and I think it's something that all the viewers should check out as well. Well, all Corvettes are cool. <laughs> I can't thank the Kerbex enough. What a great ride this is gonna be.